the book of Acts, chapter 18. Acts, chapter 18, we're going to be reading and studying verses 1 through 17 this morning. Acts, chapter 18. The great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, said there are three great truths. First, that there is a God. Second, that he has spoken to us in the Bible. And third, that he means what he says. With that in mind, let's read what God has spoken to us in this portion of his word, knowing that this comes directly from his own voice and that he means what he says. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. May God bless the preaching of his word. In 1853, a 21-year-old man named Hudson Taylor left Liverpool, England, headed for China. He was determined to preach the gospel to the unreached masses of the Chinese nation. After a number of years and a severe sickness that required him to come back to England for recovery, in 1865, as one article puts it, Taylor himself was racked with doubt. He worried about sending men and women unprotected into the interior of China. At the same time, he despaired for the millions of Chinese who were dying without the hope of the gospel. In 1865, he wrote in his diary, for two or three months, intense conflict. Thought I should lose my mind. Then he had a breakthrough. While walking on the beach, Taylor's gloom lifted. He wrote, there the Lord conquered my unbelief. And I surrendered myself to God for this service. I told him that all responsibility as to the issues 
and consequences must rest with him. And that as his servant, it was mine to obey and to follow him. Eventually, Hudson Taylor is credited with bringing or inspiring 800 Christian witnesses to the country of China. As he wrote elsewhere, God is not looking for men of great faith. He is looking for common men. Common men to trust his great faithfulness. In Acts chapter 18, we have a picture of his great faithfulness. And it calls us to trust him with the mission of our lives. Now, not all of us are called to be Paul or Hudson Taylor for that matter, but all of us are called to represent and serve the Lord faithfully in our lifetime. And all of us are faced with moments of doubt and insecurity where we question the task in comparison to our limited strength. And all of us need the story of Paul in Corinth to inspire us, to motivate us, to remind us that God does not need the greatness of our faith. He needs the direction of our faith to be focused on his great faithfulness so that we can entrust our mission, the mission of our lives, the mission of our church, the mission of our witness. We can entrust our mission to the sovereign care of our Lord. And that's the goal of this story about Paul in Corinth as he meets his faithful long-term friends, Aquila and Priscilla, as he begins to speak in the synagogues, faces persecution again, but also conversion, as he faces this incredible prospect of, of further opposition. The Lord comforts him by his own presence and this promise of divine protection. As the Lord oversees even a, a trial where the, even the, the, the Roman ruler of the area is, is used of the Lord to protect Paul. Ultimately, what we're seeing in this story is God's sovereign care over Paul and over the mission of his gospel. That it is in the hands of the Lord. As Taylor said, he, we, can, we can surrender ourselves to God and that all responsibility as to the issues and consequences rest finally with him. And that is what Paul learned in Corinth. And I think that's why Luke records this story. He includes it in the story of Acts so that our church, so that you and I, when we are facing moments of doubt and insecurity, we can rest all the consequences and the issues in the hands of our Lord, that his sovereign care is what carries the mission forward. I'm going to walk through this story in, in sort of three movements, and then we'll make some application. First of all, partners. Partners, you notice when Paul comes into Athens, he, he is alone. He had to leave Silas and Timothy behind. If you remember, there was this intense persecution in Thessalonica. They followed him then to Berea. He was not able to stay long in either location. He has to go to Athens. He is there apparently somewhat briefly. He has a somewhat mixed response. There is some conversion, but many are mocking him in Athens. And then he makes his way to to the overwhelming city of Corinth. Now, in that day, Corinth was one of the largest cities in the Roman world. It was this massive city, a couple hundred thousand people at that point, a very large city. It was a commercial powerhouse. It was known basically for its arrogance and its immorality. It was massive and it's known for those things such that even the word Corinth began to be a, a parallel to uh, an immoral person. So you can almost feel, I imagine a little bit like what Hudson Taylor was feeling as he journeys to this massive nation of China. As Paul comes alone into this overwhelming city of Corinth with all of its debauchery and its social and commercial pride. And here he is, he's facing this city alone. He doesn't have his friends, he doesn't have his helpers. And here he is with a mission all by himself. Well, the first thing God provides for him is partners. There's something comforting in this story about Aquila and Priscilla. Now, readers of Luke's account would, would recognize those names just like we do. 
That there's something of a, a valuable kind of preciousness when, 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 when Luke introduces Aquila and Priscilla, the, the leather workers who were sent out of Rome and have found their way to Corinth. There, there's, a, there's a preciousness to their names because these would be Paul's lifelong friends and companions and co-workers. They're referenced in Romans, they're referenced in Corinthians, the the letter, they're referenced in 2 Timothy at the end of Paul's life, that they're called Paul's fellow workers, and here he is introduced to them. So what, what does God do, first of all, when Paul comes to this overwhelming city? He brings them him someone who will be lifelong fellow workers, dear companions in the gospel. And not only that, people who can help him support himself as he faces the task of ministering in this city alone. He has not, it seems, yet received the supporting gift from Thessalonica. It seems that later on, when, Saul, when uh, Silas rather and Timothy come from Thessalonica, They bring a gift of ministry support to Paul, probably to help him devote himself full time to the work. But before that, he he has to eat. And so here he is in this city. He doesn't have a lot of support. And so he's able to find these two eventually dear friends and work with them while he reasons in the Sabbath. You can just feel the, 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 the sovereign care and protection of Paul. He doesn't have enough money to eat. Apparently, we, we learned elsewhere in Corinth that the other reason Paul worked was that he wanted to be very clear in that commercial, arrogant culture that this gospel was not just a business. So he had other reasons for working as well. He didn't just want to preach as though he's some rhetorical, uh, gifted rhetorical speaker for hire. No, he has a mission to impart. So he has multiple reasons for working. But in that, he's able to find these, these dear friends and God provides for him. And he works with them as he reasons in the Sabbath every Saturday trying to speak to the Jews about Jesus. So the first thing God cares for him in is providing him with partners. And I think that's true generally. Generally, I think we see in the the Gospels and the book of Acts and the story of the early church that, that God does bring gospel partners to those that are called to his mission. That's one of the reasons when we plant churches, we, we look to send out church planting teams. Because often, even when he's alone, you have this account of God bringing him partners right, right away in Corinth. Paul doesn't like to be alone. You get that clear sense. When he's, when he's somewhere in a city, he doesn't, he doesn't like it until his, his fellow partners are there with him. And so as a church, and as we look to plant churches in the future, that's something that we want to make sure happens as well, that there are are gospel partners, that as we send people into maybe foreign countries or foreign cities, that that there is a partners with them, helping them and and building them up and caring for them as they go. Because like Paul, we we want there to be people that co-labor like Aquila and Priscilla did. Partners. Second movement, progress. Progress. We notice in verse 5 that Silas and Timothy come. There are reinforcements that arrive from Macedonia. And Paul, they find him, as they always would, occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And yet, as it is throughout the book of Acts, the progress of the gospel often faces initial opposition. So there is no progress in Acts without the familiar mantra of opposition. We've been long enough in this book to know that's normal. That's normal. The progress of the gospel comes in the context of opposition. It doesn't often go unhindered. It doesn't often spread without reaction. Often, if there's going to be progress for the gospel, opposition goes hand in hand with it. Always good for us to remember that, that we, we don't look ahead as we think about preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel or growing as witnesses in the church. We're not sort of hoping for this unhindered, broad road of, of easy ministry. No, what we're expecting is that as the gospel bears fruit, it will also produce opposition. That's what Paul experiences. That's the nature of gospel progress in a fallen world. So Paul experiences it again. 
He is preaching in the synagogues again about Jesus and to demonstrate that the Christ was Jesus. So what is he doing? He's looking at the Old Testament scriptures with these Jews in the synagogue. He's pointing back again and again. Luke doesn't include his preaching here because we've already had enough samples of it in the book of Acts. But he's looking at Isaiah 53. He's looking at Leviticus 16. He's looking at all these passages that predict a Messiah. And he is saying, look, all that the Old Testament anticipated was fulfilled filled in the life of Jesus. He is the servant of the Lord. He is the root that had no beauty or majesty about him. He is the one who died on a cross. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. He is the Messiah you have been anticipating. All the Jewish expectations were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. You can imagine in that synagogue, Paul persuading them, can't you see that all the things we are hoping for, the demonstration of God's faithfulness in the coming of a second David that would renew and restore the people of God has taken place in Jesus. And he's preaching and persuading and urging and arguing. And what happens? They oppose and revile him for it. They oppose him. You are wrong, Paul. God's Messiah could not be cursed. No great man comes from Nazareth. Jesus is just a man. He was a criminal teacher, a blasphemer. He is not the Son of God. So say the Jewish synagogue, probably the synagogue leaders. They are They are resisting. They're reviling. You fool, they say. You're out of your mind. So much so that Paul eventually decides it is time to fulfill a prophetic word from the Old Testament where God said to an Old Testament prophet, look, if you don't tell the people there's danger coming, their blood is on your head. But if you tell them clearly and emphatically that there is danger coming and they still reject you, well, then you are innocent of their ultimate judgment. And so Paul now applies that to himself and the preaching of the gospel. He says, that is true in this case. And he has this symbolic gesture where he shakes out the folds of his garment It's a way of saying, so great is the judgment coming upon you for rejecting the Messiah. I don't even want the dust of your town associated with me. So it's this crushing judgment he pronounces on this synagogue. So great is God's judgment against those who refuse to believe in Jesus. I don't even want to have, I don't want to be associated with your dust. You've, you've seen, you know, in cartoons, you know, the, the moment where someone says some proud and arrogant thing and, and, and somebody else steps to the side because you don't want to be hit by the lightning bolt that's coming. That, that's actually what Paul is saying. He, he's kind of stepping aside saying, I, I, you, you have put yourself in the path of God's judgment. You've heard and yet you refuse to receive. Let me just say a word. If, if you are a person that's grown up in the church, and, and often with the church our size, we have young people that have grown up in the church. They've heard the message of Jesus, that he is the king of the world, that he is the savior of sinners, that he is the judge of the living and the dead. They've heard it again and again in their ears. And yet their heart re- continues to, to reject Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. You, you need to receive this warning from Paul. Paul is not playing around. He's saying, I, I don't want to be anywhere near you because there's nothing more dangerous than saying no when God says come to Jesus. There, there's nothing more dangerous than that. That is the most deadly virus known to man. The virus of sin that says no when God says come to Jesus will kill and destroy every human that is involved with it. And that's true of church kids who go to church their whole life and grow up and attend churches and come in on a Sunday, but their heart is not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. They have not admitted that they're a sinner and called on him to rescue them. They they sit in church and they listen to sermons, but their heart is merely there in body. Their soul is not seeing seeing Jesus as Savior. They're they're no different than this synagogue that heard about Jesus but reviled him. 
Don't be like these people. Because Paul says, there is nothing else I can do for you. And that's true of me as well. There is nothing else I can do for you than to plead with you to accept Jesus as your Savior. Because if you won't, you will face God and he will call you to account for hearing and not responding. He will say, I gave you the message of life and you said no. And there will be no judgment like the judgment on those who heard about Jesus and said no. That's what Paul's saying. And he pronounces this judgment on them definitively. He effectively says, I I have done all I can. It is a waste of my time to do more. I now go to the Gentiles. And so he literally gets up out of the synagogue. He's been there apparently week after week after week. And he goes next door to this person who is apparently a worshiper of God. He is somewhat uh, listening to the message of Paul. And he's going to preach to the Gentiles now in the hopes that they will listen. Now, as he makes this move, we notice immediately there is progress in the gospel, even among the Jews. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue in verse 8, believes in the Lord together with his entire household. So apparently not all of the Jews reject. There is a remnant that chooses to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And then it says many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul in verse 8, believed and were baptized. And just a quick note on baptism. It's referenced a number of times in Acts, and I don't want to neglect it. Baptism is this public expression that you believe in Jesus. And you can see why it would be so valuable in a city like Corinth, as it is today. Because it's possible to claim in private that you believe in Jesus, but to be unwilling to stand in in a public, kind of obvious, physical way and declare, I believe in him. So what these Corinthians are doing is they're saying, I believe that this Jewish man named Jesus is the savior of the world. A very bold and courageous step of faith that they're taking. And so there is this progress that begins to take place in the gospel. And that leads us to the third movement, protection. You can imagine Paul's dilemma at this point. (laughs) Paul's a man. I mean, he he doesn't have some sovereign knowledge of everything God's going to do. He doesn't know what the next 18 months should be. It wasn't like God told him, okay, here's your schedule. I want you to go to Thessalonica for a day, um, and then you're going to be chased out of town, and then go to Berea. Then they're going to come and chase you. You're basically going to be there for two weeks, then go to Athens for a couple of weeks, and then go to Corinth, and you're going to be there for 18 months. Like, he doesn't have that plan. So he, he's understandably facing this dilemma. Okay, what what do I do right now? There's been significant opposition, some fruit. There's been progress. People are getting saved. Boy, Crispus and and some of these other Corinthian believers, they could use some teaching. We need to establish this church. Should I I leave Silas again? Should I keep going? What, What do I do? Will I face more severe persecution if I stay? Will that endanger the church? You can feel the dilemma. What's he supposed to do right now? What's he called to do? Then we have this marvelous word that comes to him from the Lord in a vision. The Lord said to Paul in verse 9, one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. It's just precious, marvelous encouragement from the Lord. The Lord himself, the Messiah, the Savior that Paul has been preaching. He comes to Paul. Paul has this this vision in the spirit where he, he envisions the Lord coming to him and speaking these words of encouragement to him, saying to him, I am with you, Paul. I want you to stay here I want you to not be afraid. I want you to keep on preaching as you have been about me. And I'm not going to let anybody harm you in this city. And that's because I have many people that I want to rescue in this city. There is a a work that I want to do here. And I'm going to make sure it happens. And nothing is going to stop it. And no one is going to stop you until the work I have for you to do is done. You are in my hands and in my company. 
You can, you can feel in this, this promise the, the exact same relief that Hudson Taylor felt to, to leave the consequences and the issues to him. And the Lord says, you are in my hands and I will hold you and carry you and protect you and nothing will happen to you outside of my control. And he gives him this very unique promise. You're not even going to be harmed. Obviously not a promise for every Christian in every time. Paul was just harmed a few months ago. But in this season, there's going to be an unusual even display of sovereign protection. You're not even going to be harmed, Paul. They're not even going to be able to attack you to bring about your harm. Because I am with you. And I have people in this city. And I have a plan for those people to be rescued. There is this promise of protection. And then we see the fulfillment of it. Paul stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. You've got to feel the surprise of this in the early church. I mean, Paul was on the move by necessity. I mean, he was in Thessalonica like, what, like a week? And he's chased out of town? And, and before that, and we, we know the story is in Damascus, and they're, they're searching for him, and all these times he has to be lowered out by a basket over the wall because the king's ready to chop off his head. They're after him all the time. He's such a, a profound preacher of the gospel that, that people are constantly looking to kill him. And God does this miraculous work where for 18 months... He is preaching, and we can imagine conversions happening among Jews and Gentiles. People are being radically saved. The church is growing. There's a total differentiation between the Corinthian culture of immorality and arrogance, and it's now being turned upside down by Paul's preaching, as he says in 1 Corinthians 2, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Because the preaching does not rest in the power of God, the power of man, but in the wisdom of God. And so as he says in his letter to the Corinthians, that's how I was with you. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling because the, the, the power of the gospel does not rest in my eloquence. It rests in the preaching of Christ and him crucified. It is attended by the power of the Spirit. And we see that on display in this promise. God is with Paul. He strengthens him. He, he, he holds him. He guards him and protects him. And we see the promise continue even after, after 18 months apparently. At some point, the Jews bring this united legal attack on Paul. And they take him to Gallio, the proconsul in verse 12. And they say, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Now, the commentators disagree about whether they're referencing the Jewish law, which would seem to undermine their argument, because why would Gallio care? Or are they arguing that he's undermining the, the Roman law, which would seem to have more of a legal case to be made? But we don't know. In any case, essentially what they're trying to say is, look, the Jewish religion is accepted as an acceptable religion in Roman law. Paul is teaching something different, and you should count him illegal. What they're hoping he says is, Paul, you are out of bounds. For you to preach here is illegal. Christianity is illegal in this town. The church and you must go, must stop. That's what they're hoping for. But before they can even cause the trial to proceed, before Paul is even allowed to say anything, Gallio, the proconsul, responds. If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law. See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. So he drove them from the tribunal. What's happening here? This is very, very important in the early church. Because this establishes a legal precedent that will exist at least for a number of years while the church is being established. This is a big deal. Now, eventually, Nero rises to power, and the Christians are persecuted legally and so forth. But, but at least initially, there is this protection under Roman law for Christians to preach. And in some ways, it's, it's surprising because you would think that Galilee would be much more concerned about pleasing the Jewish people in the town, who certainly had some social standing, rather than this upstart religious preacher, but for some unknown reason, humanistically speaking, Gallio says, I I'm not even going to listen to your case. I'm not listening to your case. This has nothing to do with me. 
Well, now the early church has this legal precedent that they can point to. Gallio. Gallio, very significant prestige. He he declared this to be out of bounds as a Roman litigation issue. Then, either the Jews or the Gentiles were not sure, somebody right there, they grabbed this guy Sosthenes and they begin to beat him in front of the tribunal. Again, commentators aren't sure. Was this the Jews that did this? Was this just general anti-Semitism going on? We, we don't know. But basically, it's an attempt to make Gallio do something. So they grab this guy. We don't know if he's a Christian or if he's not a Christian. Somehow they just grab him because Gallio is just not paying attention. And they just begin <laughs> to beat the guy. I mean, it's almost, it's almost like this comical, like childlike tantrum in an attempt to get attention from a parent. Have you ever seen a child that like screams and cries and then the parent goes and it's quiet and you come back into the room and they start screaming and crying again because they want attention? That's essentially what's happening here. They grab some random guy and they start beating him in front of Gallio. I mean, poor Sosthenes, I mean, he, he didn't go having any intention. He's like, what? I'm not even, what, what's happening here? What's, what just happened to me? And, and it says Gallio pays no attention. Now, as Luke often does, he invites us to see the sovereign hand behind the surprising human interactions. What's happening? Paul is legally safe. Even a mob cannot induce Gallio to do anything against Paul. Isn't that surprising? Later on, when Paul's in Jerusalem, the mob induces the Roman centurion to take Paul as a prisoner. And Paul's in jail for a lengthy period of time. Here, Gallio does nothing. Get out of the courtroom. And they start beating him in the back of the courtroom. I don't care. I'm going to lunch. I don't care. I'm not doing anything. I'm not dealing with you people. Well, well, Paul walks out a free man, free to continue teaching, free to continue preaching. The church can continue to gather. There will be no legal sanctions against the Christian church in Corinth. And since Corinth is such an important city and Gallio is such an important Roman ruler and prefect, it's a very important precedent going forward for Christian churches. What's happening? God is protecting his witness, his church, by his sovereign care, by his divine design, such that even the Roman proconsul unwittingly is being used to make the gospel have protection and progress in that city. And that is true in every country. The will of the king or the president or the governor or the senator or the congressman or woman is in the hands of the Lord. The Lord decides what laws there shall and shall not be in the land. And obviously, we celebrate Christians that work in politics, and we applaud their efforts to create laws that would protect the religious freedom that we enjoy in this country. But we also need to remember, and especially as Americans who enjoy this kind of freedom on a weekly basis, that ultimately, the decision of the governing rulers is in the hand of the Lord. Why did Gallio say that? Not because he was bored, but ultimately because of verse 9. The Lord declared that Paul would have a freedom to preach in that city, and no governor could say otherwise. The Lord declared that the gospel would be free from harm in that city, and no governor could say otherwise. And the same is true today. When the Lord declares the gospel will go forward, the church will be protected, no governor will say otherwise. And if the Lord decides that suffering will serve somehow his church and help them to purify themselves and grow, well, then no governor can say otherwise. All of the decisions of the kings and the rulers and the governors of this world are in the hands of the Lord. And no one can say otherwise. Whether it's mob rule, beating some modern-day Sosthenes, or it's some disinterested ruling governor or legislature, or someone with an agenda or without an agenda, who's paying attention or who's not paying attention, who should be caring but who isn't caring, who is caring and who shouldn't be. Whatever it is, this story tells us, look, the Lord's will will stand. And his church and his witnesses and we are in the sovereign care of the Lord. 
What's the point of this? Entrust the mission to the sovereign care of the Lord. Entrust your life. Entrust the mission of your life to the sovereign care of the Lord. Let's make a few applications for us. Not all of us are called to be Paul. All of us are called to witness to the gospel. All of us are called to obey the Lord in the calling that he has given to us. In the early church, when they heard this, not all of them thought I should run to Corinth and preach in Corinth the way Paul did, but all of them thought whatever the Lord has called me to do, I can do with the same security and confidence. What does this mean for us? Well, I think for parents, it means entrusting the Lord with your mission to your children. You have a mission to your children. And sometimes they are just as overwhelming as the Corinthians ever were. (laughs) You have a mission, don't you? I do. And as I've heard others say, and I know you say it's the hardest mission I know of. You have a mission to your children to represent the Lord to them, to teach the gospel to them, to share the word with them. And it requires the same doggedness and interpretation that Paul had. You have a mission to your children. And it's a mission that you can entrust into the sovereign care of the Lord. When you are opposed or even reviled by your children, You can entrust yourself to the Lord who says he is with you. Every parent I know at some point, whether when their children were young or old, were reviled. And you can entrust the Lord being with you in that moment. Because the Lord holds your mission in his own sovereign care. Young moms, if I can say that especially to you, whether the reviling is the infant reviling of a demanding child or it's an older reviling of someone who is stretching their philosophical muscles and looking for some expression that will get you angry, your mission is held and accompanied by the Lord himself. I think our mission as witnesses, which covers all of us, is the most obvious application for this passage. Like Paul, we are called to represent the gospel to neighbors and co-workers, to continue speaking and not be silent as the Lord gives us clear opportunity to do so. And the Lord is with us whether it be to parents or grandparents or neighbors or co-workers, the Lord is with us as he was with Paul. He is with his church as the church bears witness to the gospel. And we can entrust that mission to the sovereign care of the Lord. And we can receive from the Lord the same command. Go on speaking and do not be silent. Go on befriending. Go on taking that next step. Go on building that next conversation. Go on looking for opportunities Go on speaking. I am with you. And nothing will happen to you apart from my sovereign care. What about our mission for those of us that are in the workplace? We we have a mission to represent the Lord, to serve our employer, our employees, to honor him by adorning the gospel with hard work to glorify him so that the, the witness of the gospel has, a, has a, a, a ready example in the way that we do our work with our integrity and our faithfulness. This Thursday morning, some of you, when you, you're driving into work and you're sitting there and you're doing the spreadsheet or you're having the meeting or you're answering the meme, email, that there is a, a mission of being salt and light in the world that represents or adorns the gospel. And it is a hard mission. It is often monotonous. It is difficult. It is at times uncertain because we don't know when the next downsizing comes or when the next office gospel will take us out. We, we don't know when those things happen, but we can entrust that mission into the hands of our sovereign, caring Lord. 
you can. Will the next paycheck be enough? I am seeking to provide for my family. Will I be able to face this disparaging boss? Will I be able to endure this season of work trial? Well, the mission that we have in honoring the Lord by working to provide is in, in the caring and present sovereign hand of our Lord. And the Lord provides his own personal presence and care in that mission as well. And finally, I want to address the fulfillment of our life dreams, the the mission of our life, and call it that. I especially had in mind uh, those that are in or past middle age. You can self-define that. In or past middle age, whatever that is, if you just feel old. You know, many, many people I know when they are in or past middle age, and, and even when they, they reach older age, uh, they begin to experience nagging doubt and regret and uncertainty about their faithfulness in the mission. When, when you're young, you're, you're full of ambition and optimism and and a certain degree of hubris about your abilities and what you'll be able to accomplish. And when you're older, you begin to realize some of that is impossible. And that begins to lead to doubt and suspicions and questions. Am am I really doing? Did I really do what the Lord had for me to do? Moments of regret, moments of difficulty about the mission of your life, not just one part of it, but all of it. Is, Is all of my life been worth it? Have I fulfilled the call of God on me? Or have I not? Have I not fulfilled that call? You can worry about what you leave behind. and Will what I built survive? Will what I labored to do do any good? Will, will my efforts have, have, have any long-term benefit? Will, will God use what I've done? Can, can I really entrust my life lived to the sovereign care of the Lord. I've always been encouraged by the following quote from one of my favorite Puritans, John Owen. He wrote The Glory of Christ and about 97 other books. Um, A great writer. But when he was facing his final illness, he died at a relatively young age, facing his final illness, he wrote this. I am going... To him whom my soul hath loved, or rather hath loved me with an everlasting love, which is the whole ground of all my consolation. I am leaving the ship of the church in a storm. He was a pastor. But while the great pilot is in it, the loss of of a poor under rower will be inconsiderable. Live and pray and hope and wait patiently and do not despair. The promise stands invincible that he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. While the great pilot is in it, a loss of a poor under rower will be inconsiderable. Ultimately, at the end of his life, Owen was not trusting his mission, his pastoral mission, ultimately to his labors or his writings or his future uh, hopes and dreams of more ministry now cut short by illness. He, He was not ultimately trusting his mission to those things. Ultimately, ultimately, he realized this ship that I care deeply about is not piloted by me. It is piloted by the Lord. And the same is true for every Christian of any age. This ship, however I have rowed, however poorly or well, strongly or weakly, well uh, past tests in some moments and broken promises in others, however I have done, ultimately, this ship is not piloted by me. It is piloted by the Lord. 
And that is the promise that God gives to Paul. Look, what ultimately, Paul, is the confidence that you should have? Ultimately, I have many people in this city. So you have work to do, and you should work hard while you have strength to do it. But ultimately, it is the fact that I have people in this city, that I have things for you to do, that I have purpose for your life, that I have fruit for your labors to fulfill, that I have a plan that will not be thwarted. Ultimately, that is the pilot we trust in. That's what Paul in Corinth is saying. Little Paul comes to the huge city of Corinth with its overwhelming and grotesque vision of morality and human pride. But God has a plan for that city, a plan that will not be thwarted and that will come about through Paul's weak efforts. And God has the same plan for our church and for your life. The mission of our church, the mission of your life, the mission of your ministry and your labors and the various roles of your life ultimately is in the hands of a present and caring sovereign Lord. And no regret or weakness or limitation or sin will stop him from using us or using you to fulfill his purpose for the gospel. So that our eyes and our hope are fixed on the great pilot who will bring his ship home at the end of the storm so that we can entrust our lives and our mission and our ministry to his sovereign care. Let's pray.